Today on Primary Care, obesity. It can be difficult to live with and equally difficult to accept. When I looked in the mirror, I could see weight gain, but I couldn't see 410 pounds. Hello, and welcome to Primary Care, where each week we zero in on topics that impact the health of patients, families, and communities. I'm your host, Dr. Lonnie Joe. Obesity is raging havoc in the black community. It increases the risk of diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, and certain cancers. In fact, obesity could become more dangerous to a person's health than smoking. Here with me today to talk more about this topic is Dr. Michael Wood. Dr. Wood is the Chief of Bariatric Surgery at Harper University Hospital at Wayne State University. Welcome to the show, Dr. Wood. Thank you, Dr. Joe. Yeah. Mike, we see in our community that four out of five African-American women are basically overweight. This is a desperate problem that we're facing. You've been in this community for a long time uh, dealing with this problem of obesity. Give us a little bit about the history, how it evolved, and where you're at now in terms of the practice and the approach. Sure. Well, bariatric surgery is a, a discipline that's designed for people that are, have a severe problem with their weight. And we use a term called the BMI or body mass index. And so that's the ratio of the weight to the height. And so if your body mass index, well, well, normal is below 25, 18 and 25. Overweight is, is, 20, is about uh, 25 to 30. And then you get in the category of obesity is 30 to 40. Then you get in the category of what we call severe obesity or morbid obesity. And that's where patients are considered as candidates for a surgical procedure called bariatric surgery. And what do the numbers look like at this point uh, here in your program in terms of totals? So um, we, we evaluate patients in terms of their risk assessment for bariatric surgery, and then we have to decide whether they're a good candidate. So we see a number, large number of patients that may not qualify for or may have to have delayed their surgery for, for a certain length of time based on uh, their, their workup. And risk factors included. A absolutely, risk factors. And so that we try to get them in the best, for most programs, most insurance programs will require them to mandatory to uh, have dietary documentation in an effort to lose weight prior to surgery. We know that a lot of the patients uh, are better uh, from their surgical outcomes if they've lost a weight prior to surgery. So, so the programs are basically tailor-made for each individual patient depending on how they present prior to just rushing into the operating room and performing the surgery. That's correct. Yeah. So then there, there are a lot of different types of procedures that we do as well. And uh, one, we, we divide them into two categories. One we call restrictive. That means we're restricting the volume of food that a patient can eat at one time and also how fast they can eat. An example of that would be like a gastric band where we put a silicone ring around the top part of the stomach. So they limit the amount of food that they can eat at one time and limit how fast they can eat. And then there's another procedure called the sleeve where we actually remove about 70% of the stomach. And so it's the same type of thing uh, where we restrict the volume and also restrict how fast they can eat. Dr. Wood, talk a little bit about the success stories that you've had in terms of how patients actually improve other disease states after they've undergone bariatric surgery. It's amazing. It, it really, truly is ama amazing. We have patients that sometimes leave the hospital off their medication for diabetes. We just recently reported a study back in June uh, on our results in terms of uh, the uh, bariatric surgery for patients with diabetes. And it was m mainly, it was centered around Afro-American patients. We had a 89% resolution of diabetes with one of the procedures we do, which is called the gastric bypass. So we expect that. It's amazing to see patients that are no longer taking medicine after surgery. Matter of fact, that's one of the things that we um, attribute to the change in the uh, bariatric surgery is now called metabolic surgery. So that means it's not only for diabetes, but also for high blood pressure, also for patients that, patient that have high cholesterol, and as well patients that have uh, sleep apnea, which you're familiar with, very, very familiar with. So we're looking at some domino effects here behind the bariatric surgery being completed with a patient. So a diabetic patient, African-American, 89% achievement rate in a study. We're talking about medications that we use on the internal medicine side that are very, very expensive. So you're seeing a real cost savings to the whole healthcare community in treating a diabetic patient 
with this particular procedure? Absolutely. Our, our whole goal is to get them off their medication. And so that's my goal. So I, I'd say in general, probably 80% of the patients no longer take medicine for their diabetes. And I think the other 20%, if, if they did what I asked them to do, they would probably be off their medication as well. How about that? The, 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 the risk to the patients going into the surgery, everybody wants to know what's my risk of having a complication before I uh, undergo anesthesia or I, I'm actually on the table. Uh, talk about the risk factors associated with the procedures itself. Okay, well, so we usually go, th go through that with the patient and explain the risk. And um, one of the main risks for any surgical procedure is, is bleeding or you can have complications like uh, infection, um, you know, complications, uh, you know, one of the things that we, we're always concerned about are patients that develop blood clots. So we put them through a regimen um, and we ha give them the, what we call low molecular weight heparin um, and also get them walking very early. Um, and I tell my patients that, that we, we, um, we have a, um, a product we pr produce in their body, it's called TPA. And I tell them that that's what they get when they go to, heart to the hospital and have a heart attack, you know, the TPA. We actually make our own TPA. And so if we can get them to exercise more, that only, not only improves their risk of not having a stroke or heart attack, but also helps them from an exercise right. standpoint is burning calories. Great. Increasing endogenous TPA exactly. just by some simple measures up front and, uh, and surrounding the surgical procedure itself. Exactly. So, yeah. exactly. so then we go through that a risk assessment. Some patients will actually have to lose weight prior to surgery. I mean, we have patients that have BMIs as high as the, the highest BMI I've seen the patient actually I interviewed him out in the um, in the ambulance because they couldn't get to my office. A uh, patient would, had a BMI of 109, uh, it was 800 pounds. So all our patients are not like that. But so that patient needs a lot of uh, attention prior to surgery so that their risk assessment is a lot better. Dr. Wood, tell us about your team approach here in, in working up these patients. I know that you're surrounded by very competent staff who actually uh, helps pave the way. Uh, to the operating room as I like to think about it, but there's a lot involved with that. It's not as easy as the general public and even the medical community would think at times. Tell us about that approach. So you're right. I mean, there are a lot of people that are involved. It's not just me. It's, it's a whole group of people, not only before surgery, not only during surgery, but also after surgery. And I tell uh, my patients that um, here at Harper, I'm like one of the, uh, they give the commercial about the TV guy that uh, got the people in the background. Well, you know, I mean, I, I, I think I have all those people in the background that are, that are helping me. Uh, the pulmonologist, the intensivist, uh, the anesthesiologist, and a whole host of people, the endocrinologist, in, in the, the uh, hospitalist. So there's a whole group of people that are taking care of these patients, which makes it a lot safer. Uh, one of the things I say about, and you mentioned about safety, is that uh, we've done a lot in terms of the safety of uh, bariatric surgery. It used to be that when we were back in the 90s, we were doing the open procedures. We, we no longer do that. We do what's called minimally invasive, and we do that through a technique called laparoscopic surgery. And also I have an interest in a newer type of technique called robotic surgery. And actually I think it's kind of helped my career as well because I'm sitting down. Uh, you're going to last longer. Yes. Okay, great, <laughs> great. Let's, let's go to a break. We'll be right back. Uh, when we return, obesity I, and how it has threatened a woman's son. body and her life. There have been days where I really thought it was the end of the road for me. I have that now. Since 1918, the Detroit Medical Society has been there for physicians, patients, and the community. We were there then, and we're here now. The Detroit Medical Society, here for you. Welcome back to Primary Care. Even though her weight had become life-threatening, Susie Rookard had a hard time believing it. It was like walking around in a dream, if that makes any sense, because I had never been that heavy. So when I looked in the mirror, I could see weight gain, but I couldn't see 410 pounds. I saw maybe 299, 300, but I didn't see 400 pounds. I began to put the weight on shortly after September 2005. Um, my foot had, I had developed charcoal which is um, bone degeneration, and I couldn't walk. And so I was immobile, and so I'm eating, and I am an emotional eater. I had severe sleep apnea. I could not lay down. I had to sleep sitting up. 
Um, my blood pressure was off the chart. My blood sugar stayed high. I was on 120 units of insulin a day. Um, the diabetic sores, I had swelling, edema. When I was diagnosed with bone infection, I, I knew, I knew. Some things you don't want to face, but I knew it. And the doctor looked, he said, Susie, that's infection. I'm gonna have to amputate your foot. And I just looked at him, I says, no, you can. He was like, uh-uh. He said, it's a bone infection. And I was sick, sick unto death almost, sick. It was in my bloodstream. So they amputated my foot. Just everything that could go wrong was going wrong. And so um, my doctor told me, you're, you're not gonna live. And we've gotta get this done because this weight has gotta go because otherwise you're not gonna be here. And so ultimately um, I had bariatric surgery. The biggest risk I just felt like would be the risk of it not working, but I knew it would work for me. As far as working through challenges and, and overcoming how to stop being an emotional eater, you don't. Because you're still you. You still get angry, you still are disappointed you're still upset, you're still, things that happen throw you off your square, and then you want a Coca-Cola. You want some fried chicken. I'm gonna cook some ribs. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. In the world of bariatric though, it eventually tells on you because you'll get sick. So it's the choice, it's like, no, because then it affects your quality of life. I think a lot of people who are heavy, it's, it's a poverty piece. If you don't have the money to buy fresh, organic, you don't have the environment, if you will, you don't live in an environment where you can prepare your own salad dressing or anything, you're gonna eat a Coney Island hot dog. You're gonna buy the hot dogs three for five and a pack of hot dog buns and some chips and a pop and feed your kids or eat or do whatever it is you need to do. It's survival. Obesity is a monster. Obesity is a monster. You can either kill the beast or live with the beast. The choice is yours. Now, Dr. Wood, this is probably your typical patient. Susie Rooker has most of the things that we see from a standpoint of view of having a health condition or health conditions that has resulted and revolved around being obese. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, so we have a lot of patients that have diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and uh, sleep apnea. Uh, so those, those are the bulk of our patients. It's kind of interesting that uh, 29 million people in the United States is estimated, this is 2012 data, two, 2000, 29 million people in the United States have diabetes. So this is a serious problem. There's, uh, the other thing that, that I've recognized is that there are about 89 uh, million people that have what we call pre-diabetes. So this is a big problem. Uh, so we can stamp out some of those things. That's the thing that, that's the, our hope in terms of bariatric surgery. Right, it, it, it's, it's interesting that we've gravitated back toward using a term like pre-diabetes or pre-hypertension. Pre means that something is about to happen or eventually is going to happen. Uh, in this state though, there probably were some things that this patient could have done to prevent experiencing the end result, which was bariatric surgery. If we go back to our concept of preventive medicine, it may have been uh, a factor that could have resulted in a different outcome from her. But let's face some hard and cold facts here. People do not exercise in this country. People do not make good choices in terms of lifestyles and diet, okay? Uh, how is your program integrating those kinds of things with these surgical patients? 
Well, you really hit it on the head. I mean, there, there's we, we consider bariatric surgery a tool. It's a good stool, tool, but it's a tool. And so what we stress, I stress my patients, there are two things that make them successful. One is the follow-up, which is extremely important. And the other is a commitment to a lifestyle change. And so they can do those two things. Patients do very well. The, the visceral fat that we all struggle with, even in smaller amounts and not so smaller amounts, is something that is hard to get patients to understand because as we get older, it's more difficult to deal with. Your patients, though, represent a little bit more of a different problem. They're past the point of actually being able to even participate in exercise to some degree. You pointed out the patient with the BMI greater than 100. That's not a good advice to have this guy get out and try to exercise. He probably couldn't walk right. uh, into your office. That's why you saw him in the ambulance. But here again, if we start talking about preventive medicine and how we actually can get to these patients, maybe some of the experiences that your patients can have can be of benefit to the general population in terms of what you need to do now so you, do, you, don't, you don't wind up like this. Uh, our experience on the internal medicine side is that uh, most people in this country still want to take a pill. We've probably bought all of the exercise equipment there is. It's in the basement or in the garage not being used. Uh, your patients after surgery, how well do they do? How well do they, do they adhere to diet and exercise regimens? So we look at, in terms of success, and we define that as uh, losing at least half of their excess weight. I mean, a lot of them lose 100% of the excess weight, which I'm very proud of, and it kind of pumps me up. I'm going, they lose, I'm going, yes. Uh, so uh, what we do is that we put them on a program. Uh, the follow-up is very important. We, we, uh, we explain how important exercise is, but in addition to that, it's very important that they decrease their calorie intake. And so the point that you made about what we're going to do in the future, I think that if you can avoid... Uh, you can avoid diabetes because they're really weight related. If your BMI is 40, there's about a 40 times greater chance that you're going to develop diabetes than the normal population. And that, that only goes up in a straight line, it goes up exponentially. And so if your BMI is, is 60, there's a very good chance you're going to have diabetes. About 20% of our patients do have diabetes that we see on a daily, on a daily basis. Mrs. Rooker also pointing to the fact that she was a binge eater, uh, an emotional component to her overall well-being. I am sure that your program also encompasses some of those kind of support services for patients. Absolutely. So it's very important. They will see our dietitian will explain that. And part of the thing that happens is that as a result of their surgical procedure, there's a limitation in terms of what they can eat um, and how much they can eat. So there's some limits in terms of that, but also we stress the lifestyle changes, behavior modification, uh, dietary uh, component of it, and we, we do have a dietitian on staff that works with our patients to help with those type of things. They have to have a pre-surgical evaluation which would include a psychological assessment in terms of binge eating. And so those are some of the things that we look at actually before surgery. And this is all incorporated into the program prior to anybody given a surgery date even? That's correct. They have to go through a checklist. There are about 16 things to go through. It's kind of interesting that um, when I look at my patients, we do, we used to think that bariatric surgery called uh, a lot of things like vitamin deficiency. But now we're finding out that those patients actually had vitamin deficiency before surgery. So I call it overconsumption, undernutrition. And so about 90% of, of my patients will have some abnormal lab value, whether it's the vitamin D or B12 or vitamin C or B6 or B1 uh, or their potassium is off. I mean, they have some, uh, sometimes their albumin is low, sometimes their blood count is low, and all these things can be triggered by, by, by what we eat. And so I think it's very important that we pre-op make sure that the patient is well prepared in terms of nutrition. So we'll give them their nutrition, their vitamins, actually before surgery. And the good thing that we see when these patients come back is that the comorbidic conditions almost automatically 100% of the time are affected in a positive way after the surgery, the blood pressure coming down, the, the pain in the knees becoming less from the arthritis, and of course the lipid profiles beginning to come in line. It's certainly something that we are, are, are definitely appreciating in the overall approach to uh, care of these patients who are morbidly obese and those who are not so morbidly obese also. We're going to go to another break, and when we return, we're going to continue with Dr. Michael Wood and our discussion of obesity in our community. This is where heart doctors throughout the Midwest are bringing their toughest cases. 
where specialists from around the world come to learn, where patients who couldn't be saved before are being saved. The all-new State of the Heart DMC Heart Hospital. This is Detroit Rising. Medicine advancing the future, unfolding. The new DMC Heart Hospital. This changes everything. Welcome back to the show. Dr. Wood, you touched briefly earlier on the types of surgery that can be offered to a patient. Will you go through that again for us? Sure. There's, we divide them into our restrictive and other procedures we call malabsorptive. And restrictive means restricting how much you can eat at one time and how fast you can eat. Um, when we talk about malabsorptive, we're talking about a procedure where we're actually bypassing part of the small intestine. Example of that would be the gastric bypass procedure, uh, where you lose weight by three ways, actually four ways. One, that you decrease the amount of food that you can eat at one time. Uh, number two, you decrease how fast you can eat. Number three, there's a bypass component, so you're not absorbing calories in a part of your small intestine. And then the fourth thing is that you can't tolerate refined sugar. And what I mean by refined sugar, sugar that you add to food, candy, cake, ice cream, cookies, that type of thing. So by a result of that, you, you lose weight. Uh, something that is important. The other is the, what we call the sleeve, where we take about 70% of the stomach. And so we take a part of the stomach that stretches. It's called the fundus. I don't know if you've seen the hot dog eating contest in Nathan's, um, but uh, you know, it's two, two guys that won that contest in the last <coughs> 10 years. Yes. And they both have, uh, they're not big guys, uh, but it's point out that their stomach can stretch. And so the stomach can stretch because what we call receptor relaxation. So by removing the fundus, which is the part of the stomach that stretches, they lose weight because it doesn't stretch. And so their volume is down. Also, we produce a hormone in the stomach called ghrelin. And ghrelin is an appetite stimulus. And so when you take that part of the stomach out, you decrease the stimulation of your appetite. So they lose weight in that mechanism. The band surgery is the, uh, I mentioned is a silicone band you put around the top part of the stomach and that controls volume and how fast you can eat. Those are basically the, the three procedures that we do. There's some other uh, surgeries that are also considered embaratic surgery, uh, but those, that's the gamut of them. Certainly a multifactorial approach on every single patient. The social and economical factors associated with being obese in this country is tremendous. Potentially, there is a, a great deal of money that can be saved if we are approaching obesity properly. What is, what is your estimate in terms of the good that we're doing, not only just in dollar save, but in quality of life and how people are proceeding over the next 20, 30 years of, of their lifespan uh, post-op? We're actually doing a study looking at that, looking at the outcomes based on race and socioeconomic status. We found that, that preliminarily that uh, the African-American patients do less well in terms of weight loss there's some, a lot of things that are considering that. One is the culture. Um, we think that uh, some, of the, some of that you pointed uh, out, and I think was pointed out uh, by Ms. Ruckford, is that the um, ability to have uh, food in your neighborhood, fresh food, um, something that we talked about earlier in terms of um, uh, when you were in your trip to Europe, in terms of how we prepare our food, what type of food is available, um, how, what education process we have in terms of how we're educating the patients. And I think that's where we're going. My whole thing is to, uh, ultimately is to put myself out of business. So even though I'm a bariatric surgeon, I think the key is in terms of educating patients on proper lifestyles, uh, habits, and uh, this is going to take some time to be able to do that. But in the meantime, when I have patients that are severely overweight, we can't wait on those patients because they're at risk the whole time and so those are the patients that need surgical procedures that are very helpful. Uh, bariatric surgery has become a lot uh, less, um, comp less complications because we're not doing open procedure anymore so there's less risk of hernias. Uh, matter of fact, bariatric surgery has become as safe as having your gallbladder taken out. How about that? I just had a consultant tell me the other day, get this patient to lose 100 pounds and we'll do our per a portion of the surgery on them and bariatric certainly comes into play for them. What's coming down the pike? What's the Star Wars stuff that the uh, American uh, patient population can expect in the future and, and with this procedure? Well, we're always, uh, you know, the, the future is, uh, is great. I mean, in terms of technology, uh, as I mentioned, we've gone from laparoscopy and now we're doing robotic uh, procedures. I think that probably one day I'll probably be able to do a surgical procedure at my home in, in my pajamas. 
I mean, so I mean that we're, we're that we're far along in terms of the Star Wars technology, in terms of things that we're able to do. Uh, so I, the future is, is bright. I, again, though, I stress that um, the whole the thing that I think is not the surgery is getting to patients before the thing that you touched on in terms of preparing the patient so they don't develop diabetes, they don't develop high blood pressure, they don't have high cholesterol. Those are things that, that are on my mind uh, that we need to address. Very good. Lifestyle modification, key to it, to it all. Absolutely. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Wood, Chief Thank of you. Bariatric Surgery, uh, Harper University Hospital, Wayne State University. Thank you. As we close, there's an obesity crisis in this country that's having a devastating effect on the black community. It's important that we understand that the problem goes beyond diet and exercise. There are cultural, social, political, and economic factors that must be addressed. We, as individual patients, providers, and society, must work together to overcome and conquer this growing and potentially deadly epidemic. Until next time, I'm Dr. Lonnie Joe. Primary Care was produced with the participation of the Detroit Medical Society, representing physicians, patients, and the community.